I just completely forgot my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get back to it. Yep. Following up on that, um, uh, Rutgers had a lot of uh, short yard situations, not just on third down, but needing only three or yards or less to get the first. Mm -hmm. On those, is there, and especially when they're running on the interior kind of consistently mm -hmm. in those situations, is it less about scheme and more about kind of toughness and physicality up front? I mean, is there a limit to what scheme can do when they're just constantly just running on the inside to only need a yard or two? Yeah, I think there's a combination of both, right? There's uh, ways to take away where the ball is being directed. Um, and there's other times that, you know, you feel really good about the number of hats that you have compared to that they have. And then it is it's technique and fundamentals from there, toughness, mentality, you know, that we preach throughout the week. So I would say a combination of, of both those things. And what did you see kind of on the tape you know, where the breakdowns happened? Because they converted a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say a combination of both, right? There's times that we say, okay, hey, we feel really good about the defense that we're in and – we're able to limit them and we've got to tackle efficiently and we've got to be able to whip blocks and use our hands. And um, other times you say, okay, how could we call something to be able to get an extra hat, you know? And um, when you saw the stops, that's what happened. And when there wasn't, it was a breakdown of, of the other way. I recognize there's no sort of 100% solution, but when you have a position group that takes a lot of hits, whether it's the injuries or obviously Lewis Moore getting disqualified for the targeting, in really quick succession, just what, how do you approach basically, in this case, it's, it's safety, mm -hmm. trying to fit so many new pieces in so quickly in a game where a couple guys go down hurt pretty quickly, then another guy disappears, and suddenly you've kind of got a whole new group back there unexpectedly. For sure. Yeah, and I, I obviously run that room. You know, that's next man up, right? And that's why you train, and that's why you don't just rep – it's not like the NFL. You don't just give starters more reps than other guys. You know, you balance that because in college football, this is what happens sometimes, right? And uh, those guys step up and they're expected to do just as well as the next guy. Now, as a play caller, you know what that guy does well, right? So you have to put them in position to be successful. Um, but to me, it's, it's that simple. It's next man up mentality, and you hold those guys to that standard, and they go take advantage of the opportunity. That's right. That's right, for sure. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we always think that way too. Okay, what's the, how's the game going? What are they trying to do to us? How do we put our guys in position to be successful? Okay, now you have a new face in that position, right? What does Amari do well compared to what you know is doing well? You know what I mean? There's one example of that. Um, or, you know, Jordan versus what Lewis was doing, you know, from there. So, and then, and then you have to make sure it's tailored to there. It's not just, you know, take whatever scheme you like and smear it over every single guy, right? So you can same thing you could say from a guy that's a dynamic edge rusher versus a, a bigger body there, right? Okay, how do you put that guy in position to be successful? So and we, we do a lot of throughout the week contingency planning for situations like that. Matt, uh, obviously Rutgers was able to run the ball very successfully on Saturday. What, was, what were your evaluations like with, with the defensive line in particular and linebackers too? Uh, in terms of what you saw on film from that? Yeah, to me, it's technique, fundamentals, and fight. And in that game, you saw some good examples of that, and you saw not as good examples of that, right? So uh, what we do is we point out to show, hey, this is what we're capable of doing, us at our absolute best, and holding ourselves to that standard. You know, and then I'm honest with those guys, too. If okay, hey, I got to make sure that you guys are in the best position to be able to be successful, right? And then it's their job to go play as hard as they can with mentality and with fundamentals, you know, from there. So um, got to beat blocks, got to tackle efficiently you know what I mean like those are those are critical things to a team that's gonna run the ball 55 times in a game right is okay you have to keep them off schedule if not conversions can happen in easier situations right and then taking advantage of those third downs when okay you do have third and longer you have to get off the field well, some of the secondary losses you had felt like Amari Farrell kind of ascended into a larger role Saturday um, how have you kind of seen him evolve so far throughout his his first year in Bloomington. Yeah, he's a talented guy. He doesn't act like a freshman. You've seen him a lot on special teams. Uh, I think very, very highly of Amari, you know, and, uh, you know, pleased with the way that he comes to work every single day. Um, but he, he's got a bright future for sure. It seems like even though this is your first year here that you and Noah Pierre have really established a really good connection. Whenever he talks about you, it's always in glowing review. Kind of with his injury, have you had any personal talks with him about kind of how he's going to impact the team going forward? And, and what, what were you kind of feeling with him uh, when he went down? Yeah, for sure. My, my heart breaks for him. You know, obviously a guy who uh, has been a leader here in his sixth year. Um, you know, I hate that for him. Uh, but my first thing is checking on his well-being, right, making sure that he's okay. And if he wants uh, 
food to give me a call and I'll pick it up for him. You know, that was the first thing that I said to him, you know, and uh, whatever he needs, you know, I'm there for him. And uh, that's more important than anything. Um, but I, then I did grab him a, a second time after the dust had kind of settled, you know, after a day and um, let him know how important he is as a leader to our team, right? So just because um, he's not the health that he was before doesn't mean his impact goes away, right? So uh, he's a guy that's, you know, heart and soul of what we do and, and that'll continue. These were the types of questions that were asked a little bit more, I guess, week one, week two of the season. But uh, up to this point in the season, how do you feel like you've, you know, how would you evaluate maybe your own performance as a defensive play caller and, and just kind of the in-game adjustments and everything? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's things that we've done well and things that we need to get better at, you know, and that's, um, you know, I try to take, like I said to you before, I try to take the emotion out of it and just say, hey, did it work? Did it not work? Are our guys in the best position? You know, what are our teaching methods? And if there's a breakdown, going back to those, you know, those you you point the thumb, not the finger, and you own it all. And uh, you say, okay, hey, this is the things that we've done well and need to continue, and these are things that we have to get better at. You know, so um, that's I'm not trying to give you a run around answer, but that's just you know being real from that standpoint and just being objective. And you know, we work our butt off to put our guys in the best position. Yeah, with uh, Penn State's defense, I understand you're not coaching against them, but just as a defensive guy, I'm curious what you've kind of seen from them and uh, how they've been able to be so successful. They're, you know, towards the top of the country in points allowed and things like that. For sure. Yeah, they're talented, and then they've, they've got a good scheme too, you know. So I've known uh, Manny Diaz for a long time when he was uh, at Mississippi State. was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time down there, and he was gracious to have me come say hello to him. And, uh, you know, when I was at Duke, he was at Miami. You know, so we've uh, gone against each other at times. And, um, but I have a lot of respect for Manny and what he's been able to do. But, you know, definitely one of the best in the country. Matt, just a quick question about, did you see a better, a more disciplined defense this week than the week before? Were you more pleased with that aspect of it? And then number two, how much have some of the problems this year been caused by the fact that you've got so many young guys or new guys on the defensive side of the football? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, you can't take away plays, right? But that 80 yard run was not a disciplined moment, right? And then a missed tackle opportunity. Besides that play, I, I did think there was a higher level of discipline, you know? Um, but you can't take that away. It's got to be every single snap for the duration of a game. Um, and then I'm not one to make excuses about new faces or young guys. You know, this is a, a great group of young men that it's our job to, you know, get in position to be able to go make plays and excel and play great defense, right? So um, to me, that's, that's on all of us together as we, you know, continue to build. Hey, Matt, uh, uh, over here, just in terms of uh, Penn State's offense, what do you see from them? How explosive do you see them? Yeah, they're explosive. They've got a, a quarterback that has talent. They have running backs that, you know, have, have shown a bunch of talent. They have receivers. They have tight ends, the line. You know, I mean, they've got every piece, you know, and they've been able to score a bunch of points on a, a number of teams, you know. And, um, you know, last year saw them face-to-face, -face, you know, obviously when I was at Ohio State at Penn State, and that was a fourth-quarter game, and they were able to, you know, create some explosive plays in that game. Um, you know, so that's, you know, I've seen it firsthand, and uh, i got a lot of respect for these guys. You mentioned earlier the 80-yard uh, run from Wimsat. Um, after Akron, there was a lot of talk about limiting the QB run, kind of all that stuff. Do you feel like you've made progress in that regard? I'm pretty sure Wimsat, outside of that run, had like 15 for 63. So in, uh, 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 whether it's inside of structure, outside of, stru outside of structure, how do you feel like you guys have kind of improved in that regard? Yeah, it's... Um the results are the results, right? So th that run can't happen. So my answer would be it's not good enough, you know, from there. Um, has there been a focus point and has been, there been times that it's been better? Yes, you know. Um, and then you look at the designed quarterback run versus scrambles and, you know, okay, run situations, pass situations, we evaluate all that together. But um, it's got to be better than it is. This may be a dumb question, and if it is, just tell me. But no, no such thing. Is, is there ever an advantage in, in – Playing a team like Penn State, coming off a game like Ohio State, not necessarily the idea that maybe it was very physical for them, but that you saw them stress tested maybe as much as they will be in terms of the athletes they had on the other side of the field, the you know just the, the quality of the opponent. Basically, you're seeing something approaching what would be Penn State's best. Is it all? Is do you get maybe a better look at a team like that in that situation? I don't think at this point in the year, no. Um, you know, maybe if. It, you know, in early season, or early games in the season, sometimes you see a more vanilla game plan, you know, and a, a lesser opponent maybe compared to a, 
you know, a top 10 matchup from there. But I think at this point you've seen, you know, who they are and what they want to be from there. And I got a ton of respect for, for what they do. This might be a question better asked by Zach since he asked it to Tom, but kind of on the premise of the targeting penalty, mm -hmm. do you think that there could be some sort of system where there's kind of a, a less severe penalty for certain instances of targeting versus others, kind of like a flagrant one, flagrant two system? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about judging intent, right? You know, and that's, um, of course, as a defensive guy, you know, and, and you know, I totally respect the intent of the rule and understand why it is what it is. Um, that's a situation where there's not malintent. You know, a guy's going to make a play, a receiver ducks down last minute. And we talk a lot about, like a baseball player, strike zone of where we should tackle and things like that, right? And we coach that really hard. Um, but, yeah, it's unfortunate in those situations when a guy's trying to make a routine play um, and that happens. So I totally respect the intent of the rule and, you know, from that standpoint. But I, I, I see it from the other side, too. Thanks, guys.